Well, good morning and welcome to In Church at Home. It is so wonderful to have you online with us this morning. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord together as we commence our time. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that you are with us this morning and that we can worship you online. Lord, we ask for your presence to minister to us right where we're at right now. Lord, we thank you that your promise is that you are with us. And so, Lord, we invite you to encounter us right where we're at. Lord, we give you our worries, our troubles. Lord, the things that might distract us from being able to enter into this time. Lord, right now we stop, we pause, and Lord, we say, have your will and have your way. Lord, we hand to you those things that uh, are weights and worries, and we ask for a divine exchange right now. We give you those weights and those worries, and we ask you, Lord, for your peace. We thank you for that peace that surpasses circumstance and understanding. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. Lord, we ask this morning that you would speak into our lives and that we would be forever changed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said or typed in the chat, amen. Well, thank you so much for being uh, online with us this morning. Uh, we just want to let you know a couple of things. Uh, one is, if you're in the 18 to 35-year-old bracket, uh, tonight, Young Adults is on, 6 p.m., at uh, 1 Ashmere Court, Caroline Springs, uh, come. we just love to have you come. We'd have uh, dinner together, a great time uh, using the Alpha uh, course material, which really explores issues uh, around the meaning of life and faith and uh, it just really, really great uh, uh, material. Uh, we would love for you to be part uh, of our young adults uh, group and that group is growing and uh, we, we can't wait to, to welcome you. So come along tonight, 6 p.m. The other thing that I want to let you know, and this is particularly for all the guys, is that on the 16th to the 17th of June, we have our 2023 Men's Encounter. It's going to be the Friday night, then all day Saturday, finishing about 5.30 Saturday uh, afternoon. Guys, you do not want to miss this. Our encounter team uh, is uh, already uh, assembled. They're praying and believing for this time. It's going to be a really significant time together. And I want to encourage you, do not miss it. Do not miss it. Come along. Get uh, closer to the Lord. Uh, we're believing that, uh, as uh, Psalm 1 says, that you know, men are going to be like mighty trees planted by streams of living water. That's the, the sense that we've got. God is wanting to bring such growth, such encouragement, such refreshment during these uh, this evening and day together that uh, you'll walk away never the same. And so I really want to encourage you to uh, be a part of this time. The other thing that I want to encourage you in today is your giving. Uh, you might not have made it to live church today, but worship the Lord by bringing to him the first fruits uh, of uh, your finances. You know, the Lord himself uh, honoured the tithe. Um, we are to bring uh, Lord to the Lord an offering, uh, our tithes. And, uh, you know, for Pastor Melissa and I, we have uh, always given at least the first 10% of our income. Uh, and I say at least because, um, you know, we try to give way beyond that. Um, there's something special when you say to God, I'm going to put you first in everything, uh, including your finances. Now, we try to do that with our time. We try to do that with our talents. Uh, we try to do that uh, in the way that we serve. We just want to put God first. We try to do that with the way we use our house. We want to we want to put God first in everything. And uh, and so I want to encourage you in your giving. Very easy to give. Uh, you can use the Tithely app, which is safe and secure. Or one of the really easy ways is just uh, give 
through electronic funds transfer, EFT. Uh, the church's account details are there. You can give your tithe into the general account. You can give your missions. And of course, you can give to the land and building fund. And all those account details are on the church website. And you can set those up uh, once or you can set up regular uh, amounts to go uh, from your bank into the church's account. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I wonder who likes movies? I like movies. Yell out your favourite movie at the moment. Go. Oh, okay. Who else? What else? Oh, right. Okay. Who likes Marvel movies? They're pretty popular in our house. Yeah. No, no, not at the moment. No. I like cheesy movies. Just saying. Who likes TV? TV series, binge watching Netflix. Yeah. Have you got a favourite series? Yeah. Yeah. A few people are doing this and I want to admit that they binge watch Netflix. Another question. Who's read this? Hands up if you've read this book. This isn't my message, but I felt to say to you, this book has got more danger, more excitement, more good versus evil stories, more amazingness, more anything than any movie, any TV series that you will ever see or watch. The only way, though, is you, you have to read it, okay? You have to read it. We're going to read this today, okay? I'm going to go through some stories and read this amazing book. I'm going to tell you a story from this book and some of the stories today, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. So if, if you're familiar with them, go back and read them again. If you're not familiar with them, go back and go and find them and read them and, and I'll tell you where they're from. I want to talk to you about the Israelite people. And if you know the story, the Israelites, if you remember, um, Abraham's family got really big. He took them down to Egypt. That's a whole story in itself. We'll get to that after. And then they were enslaved, ended up being enslaved by the Pharaoh. The, the good Pharaoh died. The new Pharaoh comes in and he's like, no, nah, don't like these people. We're going to enslave them. And then over generations, they grow in number, but they're absolutely enslaved and of course, then we have the incredible story of God uh, taking them out of Egypt. Remember Moses, the burning bush, he gets a revelation and then the plagues. Is this sounding familiar to some people? If you don't know this story, better than any Hollywood movie. This is crazy stuff. So, so God, he leads through Moses, leads this mass of people, like a million people at this point, I think. From memory. I meant to check, I forgot. And they, 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 they come out of slavery and they witness the plagues of, of Egypt where God gets Pharaoh's attention. And they're, they're coming out of Egypt, masses of people. And then Pharaoh changes his mind and chases them. And they witness the parting of the Red Sea. And, and they walk through the Red Sea on dry land. And then they watch it close behind them. And Pharaoh's army is killed. But the miraculous is not over yet because of then what is going to happen to these people that have now left their homes, left their enslavement. But of course, they had a promise that God would take them to the promised land. But of course, it wasn't like they just went from that to that. They had a massive journey where they travelled in the wilderness. And of course, Moses leads them. And again, better than any Hollywood movie, if you want to read the story about what happens to the people and then, of course, Moses dies and then Joshua becomes their leader. Again, lots of detail I'm skimming over. I'm just whetting your appetite to go and read, read that book. They, they eventually, they actually wander in the desert for 40 years. And that whole 40 years, they experience God's power. They experience God's discipline because being Israelites, being people, they kept forgetting that God was God and they kept turning, and then He in His graciousness would call them back again. They experienced His correction. They experienced His protection. And then all with the amazing goal of reaching the promised land. And so I want to come to a point in the story where they've crossed the river. By the way, just in that little bit in the story, God divides the waters again. You didn't know that he did it twice? He did it twice. He divides the waters again and they walk across on dry land and they enter the promised land and Joshua is now their leader. He's been their leader for a while and they're settling into the promised land and of course they have struggles there too because it wasn't a vacant lot. <laughs> it was actually inhabited by other nations that did not love God. And 
the people still have a struggle to remain faithful to God and to keep their covenant with God. And even after all they'd seen, all the miracles they'd seen God do for them and they'd seen a lot, they still struggled to stay faithful to Him. And, and this part of the story, Joshua is an old man by this point. And he calls all of Israel together and he tells them, he actually tells the leaders, I'm, I'm going to die soon. My time is up. And he says these words to them, to the whole of Israel. And he's, he's saying these words that have such power and such um, influence on people. I wonder if you knew you were going to die, what would your words be? What would you tell your family? That's just a little side question. But this is Joshua's words. And he sort of, in this one sentence, he summarised his whole life and he empowered the people to an incredible action. And you know, these words that he said, I'm about to tell you, actually have just as much influence on us today. These words were a challenge. They were a little bit uncomfortable for some, a little bit um, provocative for some. But he says this, he says, we've arrived in the promised land and each of us today have to make a choice. Can you picture him for a minute? All the people in front of him. He didn't have a microphone. I think they passed it by words of mouth to to get out. But you can picture Joshua. He's probably got his staff, holding his staff to stand upright in one hand. And I can just imagine his finger with the other hand as he says these words. He says, we might be in the promised land but we're surrounded by the world. There's a whole lot of people out there that don't love God and don't serve God. In fact, those people love evil and they have their own idols and they do their own thing and they're actually anti-God. He was talking about the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites and I think the Australianites as well. Just saying, I added that one. And he says to the people, he says, today you must make a choice. You must make a choice. You've seen and experienced what God has done for you. But if you still don't want to serve Him, well then decide who you're going to serve. And then he says this with his finger. He says, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Can you hear the power in those words? As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Craig's been talking, uh, preaching powerfully the last few weeks through um, our series this year, our theme this year about I will. And these promises aren't our promises. These are God's promises to us. But of course, as God promises us these things, He expects a response from us. He doesn't just want us a little bit. Pastor Craig said, he, he, what does He want of us? He wants all of us. Yes, He wants all of us. You were listening. That's great. <laughs> God doesn't want a little bit. He wants all of us. He wants us to daily say back to Him, I will. He wants to daily, do you remember Pastor Craig saying this, make the Jesus choice. He wants us not to make our own choices, but the Jesus choice. You know, it's Mother's Day today. We've been celebrating mums. And it just seems right to talk about families and making the Jesus choice in our families. And you know, all of us are part of families, whether they're biological or not, whether they're away from us or not, whether they're, um, you're in good uh, relationship or not. We're all a part of a family. Or at the very least, I hope you feel part of this family, this church family. And I want to talk about today from some of the amazing stories in this book about the Jesus choices that we need to make every single day in our families. Of course, the first one is the Joshua choice. I'm going to call it the Joshua choice. And that is to choose to put the Lord first in our families. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When, when we say this over our own households, it means that we're making the choice not to get swayed by the world, by the Amorites and Canaanites and Australianites around us. We're going to declare that our household where we live 
is following Jesus. And I don't care if you live by yourself, you can declare that over your house as well. It is, I'm not just talking to big groups of families or, you know, mum, dad, the kids. I'm talking about any combination, whether you've got kids, you don't, whether you live alone or you don't. You can declare over your house that as for me and this space where I live, I am going to serve the Lord. I'm going to choose not to let social media rule my world. I'm not going to choose to let what people say on Instagram rule my world. Movies or, or, or the politicians or uh, influencers that bombard us every single day. I'm going to make a stand to say that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to choose to know what Jesus says and follow it. I'm going to choose to apply it because it's not much different today from Joshua's time. I, I was deliberate in saying Australianites because it's just the same. There's, there's people out there from whatever culture or nation or whatever and they are anti-Jesus and they are not serving the Lord but we can still serve the Lord even amongst that. We can make the Joshua choice. See, Joshua didn't know Jesus just because he's part in history but he knew God and God is Jesus' Father So I ask you today, in your house, who are you serving? Who are you serving? Are you serving the Lord or are you serving somebody else? If you're a single person, who are you serving? Because if you're not serving the Lord, you're serving something else or someone else. The second choice I challenge you to make today in your families is the Joseph choice. Who knows the story of Joseph? It happened before Joshua. And you can read about it in Genesis 37. Joseph was all about forgiveness. We need forgiveness in our families, church. We need forgiveness to flow. We need to choose on a daily basis to forgive those in our families who hurt us or have hurt us in the past, no matter what they've done to us. You think your family has issues? Joseph's family had issues. Joseph, if you don't know about Joseph, he was the youngest of 12 sons and his dad did sort of um, the the biggest mistake any parent can do. He had favourites. And of course, his brothers get jealous. And if you don't know the story, you've got to go read it because it's incredible. His brothers get so jealous, they kidnap him, they almost kill him and then they sell him instead into slavery and he finds his way to Egypt and then life was okay for a while but then he got accused of doing the wrong thing and he gets thrown into prison. What choice did Joseph have really? What did he have? He, he was in prison now. He, you could say that, you might say that he didn't actually have a choice in what happened to him. It was other people doing it to him and so he didn't have a choice but actually... We always have a choice. Joseph had a choice because Joseph could have chosen to get bitter. He could have chosen to get angry. He could have chosen to reject his whole family, his world, and to reject God. He could have turned from God, but Joseph didn't. Joseph made a choice to follow God regardless, and then he made the choice to forgive every single person that has hurt him. Every single one he forgave. And because of that, he stayed connected to God and he found the purpose in what had happened to him. I want to read this amazing scene in Genesis 45. And this is the part of the scene. You're imagining you're watching the movie now of Joseph. And it's part of the scene where his brothers have come and they realise that this man who they thought was um, the leader in Egypt was actually the brother that that sold into slavery. Whoops, this is not good. But listen to this. He said, says to his brothers, come close to me. And when they'd done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold, you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land and for the next five years, There'll be no ploughing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by great deliverance. Just a beautiful scene. He could have had them killed. He could have put them in slavery. He could have done all sorts of things, but Joseph chose to forgive. Who in your family have you not forgiven? 
You could be missing out on the blessing of God because you're holding bitterness, you're holding rejection tight, you're holding it in your hand and you're not letting it go and you think it's hurting them but it's actually hurting you. Church, you need to forgive because unforgiveness will break marriages, unforgiveness will split families, unforgiveness will divide generations. If you're a Christian today, it's a command of God. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, God can't forgive you. That should be reason enough. The third choice. So we've got the Joshua choice. We've got the Joseph choice. It's the choice of the Good Samaritan. Who knows that story? Another incredible story in the New Testament. The Good Samaritan, not scared to look after those who are different. Who's got someone a little different in their family? Maybe it's an in-law. Yeah, a few hands going up. Someone a little tricky to love, a little prickly, a little, they think differently, they act differently, they press your buttons, they're just different. (laughs) The Good Samaritan, he's walking along the road and he sees a man beaten up. You know, that man's own people had rejected him, just walked straight past, but not the Good Samaritan. He stopped, he goes over. And he helps that man and he takes him to, the, to an inn and he, he sacrifices his day, his money, probably a few days, more than that, to help him. It was inconvenient. He was a busy man, but he put his stuff aside to help this person. This person was from a different group, but that didn't stop. He went the extra mile. Luke, Luke 10, listen, hear this again. He, he says, it went to him. He bandaged, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. That was first aid in those days. Then he put the man on his own donkey, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you, reimburse you for an, any extra expense, expense you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour? Jesus asked And the expert in the law said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. I think some of us have a Samaritan in our families that no one wants to love on because they're just difficult. But to make the good Samaritan choice means we put that aside, we ask for God's help and we sacrifice and we go help that person. We show them God's love regardless of what it costs you and regardless of whether they'll ever even acknowledge it or pay it back. The fourth choice. You know, we could have spent all day finding choices in the Bible, but the fourth choice I want to talk to you about. So we've got the Joshua choice, the Joseph choice, the Good Samaritan choice. This is the prodigal son choice. Another amazing story in Scripture. The prodigal son, a story that Jesus told about a young man who was living, living life well in his father's house. He had it all, but he was restless and unsettled. And he said, Dad, can you give me my inheritance? I want it now. That wouldn't be nice for any father to hear. It's basically said, you want me dead so you can have my money. But anyway, Dad gives him the money and he goes. And for a while, life's good. He's living it up. He's partying. But of course, when the money runs out, he finds himself in the dirt trying to earn money feeding the pigs. But he had a choice to make. He made, he had the choice. He could stay with the pigs. He could die in that place. He could just keep living an evil life. But he chose to go back to his father. He chose to go back to the father. He got distracted by the world for a while, but he chose to go back to his father. And Luke 15, it says, The son said to him when he came back to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. There are people, I really felt as I was preparing this, that have been a bit like the prodigal son and you've been away from God. Maybe there's whole families here that have just been off track and away from God. And, and you've just got, got your focus on the wrong things and you've got your, your priorities in the wrong order. God is telling you, Come back to me, just like that prodigal son. And he has his arms open wide to take you back as a family or as an individual. I think you know that the world will not satisfy. Maybe for a time, but then the only place is to run back to your father. 
James 4.4 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever's to, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Have you read this book lately? There's a lot in this book to help us. If you're a leader in your house, if you're a leader in your house, so maybe you're a, a mum or a dad, maybe you're the single person in your house, if you're the leader in your house, I charge you to make that prodigal son choice and lead your whole family back to God if you've been away. The fifth one, the fifth choice, another amazing story. This actually happened. It wasn't a parable. Jesus, it's called, I called it the bleeding woman choice from Luke 8. This woman, she had been sick for such a long time. And no, she tried to have doctors help her, but no one could help her. But she got a revelation that Jesus was coming past. And she made the choice not to let her difficulties or her circumstances hold her back. She made a choice to get out of bed that day, to get dressed and to walk into that crowd where she shouldn't have been because they'd all shunned her. And she made the choice to find Jesus and press through the crowd and reach out to touch Him. You know, many of us have problems in our relationships and we go, or in our families, and we go to Google or we go to the workplace lunchroom to get advice from our workmates. But of course, we know that Google won't help. Instagram won't help. And our workmates might give some good advice, but they're not the answer. Just like that woman had gone everywhere for an answer to her needs. That woman had a revelation that she needed to touch Jesus. And so she pushed through that crowd. She just denied the culture of the day and every negative word spoken against her. And she reaches him and she touches his cloak. And Jesus says to her in Luke 8, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. If your family's struggling, if you've got some young people in your life that are really struggling and because they're struggling, you're struggling, don't go to Google. Don't go to Instagram. Seek Jesus. Reach out to Him. Read the Word. Pray. Come to church every week. You know, sometimes with church, people can have the attitude, oh, I've, I've kind of come to, you know, once and I'm done for a couple of weeks. You know, last week, Pastor Craig spoke this incredible word, but some people weren't here and so they missed it. And that's what happens. If you miss church too often, you can miss an opportunity to position yourself and your family for God to speak into you. You could just miss it. It was there, it was available and you could just miss it. We need to teach our children how important church is because it's where we meet in God's presence. We worship Him and we get, we get a heart change and a heart check. I could go through so many stories in the Bible. I could talk about King David. King David committed terrible sins, terrible sins, murder, adultery, lies. But his choice was to repent and turn back to God. See, that's a good choice. The David choice, King David choice. I could talk about Queen Esther. She chose, she made a choice. She chose to put her own safety aside for the sake of her family. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to put our own, bit what Carly was talking about. We need to wear the hat to make our child feel loved, just to show them. We need to put ourselves aside for the sake of our family. I could talk about Moses, another messy family situation. I could talk about Abraham, Noah, Jonah, Timothy, Mary, Peter. All the choices though, all those people, and, and they were real people, all the choices that they made came down to one choice. Every single one came down to making the Jesus choice. Making the Jesus choice. And we make these choices every single day. We have the opportunity in every situation that we find ourselves in, in our families, to make the Jesus choice or not. To go with our own selfish, sinful hearts or to make the Jesus choice. 
The Jesus choice is the only good choice. What is the Jesus choice? I'm saying it over and over so you think of it during the week. What's the Jesus choice? It's knowing the Word of God and it's applying it. It's getting your strength from Him in every situation. You know, when Jesus came to earth and he, he, you know, the story of Christmas and he grew up and then he started his ministry and he started to teach and he, he gathered the disciples. It was a time of great turmoil in um, Israel. It was a time of great turmoil. The, the Romans were overbearing and the, the Jews wanted a saviour. And they thought that the saviour was going to come riding in on a white horse as a soldier. But of course, it was Jesus that came. And He came teaching and preaching and healing the sick. And the words He said were absolutely radical. He would say things like, you know, if a Roman soldier tells you to carry my pack for a mile, which was the Roman rule, and of course no one wanted to do that, Jesus said, well, you carry it two miles. That's where we get our saying, go the extra mile. He said things like, you know, the, the Bible, the Torah says to turn the other cheek. If someone, sorry, the Bible says uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, like get revenge. Well, Jesus said, no, turn the other cheek. If someone hurts you, don't get revenge. He said things like, love your enemy. He said things like, um, pray for those that are hurting you. These were radical teachings to the Jews. But I tell you what, church, they're just as radical today. It is totally anti-cultural, half, uh, every, nearly everything that's in the Bible. Making the Jesus choice is still radical. And it, it is contrary to what you'll see on TV, in movies, on Instagram. We make a choice not to watch that, not to say that, not to go there, not to be doing what those people are doing. We make a choice to not get revenge, to forgive even though we have every right to be mad. We make a choice to love those that aren't very nice to us. And we need to apply the Jesus choice to our families, to our relationships in our families. You know, the world says that if my marriage is getting too tough, I just walk away. The world says that I need to look after me first. If my kids are wild, well, we'll just let them run free. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus sacrificed His life for us and He calls us to do the same for each other and for our families. It's not about me. That's what the Jesus choice is. It's not about me. If we apply the teachings of Jesus the way we relate to our family, our families will be transformed. Our marriages can be what they were made to be, not a hard slog but a joy. I'm not saying you won't have hard days, but when you're having those hard days, you make the Jesus choice to love anyway. Things like a husband putting the needs of his wife before his own, a wife honouring her husband and not making a list of his faults, a son and a daughter honouring their parents even when the parents aren't always being honourable, a sister, a brother, in-laws, uncles, aunts, grandparents. There's a Jesus choice for every situation. Everything that comes up, there's a choice. Do I do what Jesus would want me to do or do I do the opposite? You know, the main Jesus choice that you can make is it's not about me. It's not about me. And the more we look to Him for guidance and we look to Him for motivation, then He helps us make those good choices. He helps us forgive those that are tricky to forgive. He helps us to um, live the way He's called us to live. I just want to say something. You alone have the option to make the Jesus choice for you. You can't make it for somebody else. You can model it to your children. You can model it to other people. but And you can pray for them, but you you get to choose for you. You get to choose for you. I wonder if the worship team would come now. You know, we've talked about the Joshua choice. We've talked about the Joseph choice. We've talked about the prodigal son choice, the bleeding woman choice. I think I missed one. What was it? Good Samaritan choice. Thank you. 
But ultimately, it all comes down to the Jesus choice. I wonder if you'd all stand. Joshua said to the people that day, with his finger outstretched, leaning on his staff, not long before he was going to go to heaven. And he said to those people, make a choice. Choose today who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Oh, 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 oh,